Welcome to Feminist Founders, a podcast that explores how to create a more equitable world through entrepreneurship. I'm your host, coach and journalist, Becky Mollenkamp. Feminist Founders is a listener-funded podcast. Your contributions enable me to continue bringing you these important conversations without corporate advertising. To support the mission, head to feministfounderspodcast.com and sign up for a paid subscription. The link is in the show notes. Now, on to today's show. Hello, friend. Today, I am excited to introduce you to Avi Fox. We have a great discussion about a concept she's still working through called successful and unknown that I absolutely adore. And probably just from those words, you may feel a bit of a, ooh, that's interesting and sounds good. Avi is amazing. She started a company called Wild Mantle, which we talk a lot about in this episode. Um, that company she eventually let go, and we talk about that as well. And then in 2018, she drew on that entrepreneurial experience to help other business owners and nonprofit leaders with their companies. She's now a consultant. She still also does photography. That's her background as well. We talk about everything in this episode. She's very open and frank and honest and shares so much that I really think people are going to feel seen and validated by hearing. And I'm so excited to share this episode with you. Before we dig in, though, please do take a minute to learn about another really wonderful podcast. Well, hey there, and thanks for letting me pop in. Are you feeling lost when it comes to the money stuff in your business? Are you confused about bank accounts, accounting systems, and quarterly taxes? Boy, do I get it. That's where the Equitable Money Project comes in. We're your one-stop shop for tax, accounting, legal, and financial education and support so that you can build the wildly successful business of your dreams. Best of all, as part of our commitment to financial equity, all of our financial education is completely free. Head on over to equitablemoneyproject.com forward slash free to grab your access to our biz money library, where you'll find all of our best workshops, templates, calculators, and guides to help you master the money stuff in your business. And now on to my episode with the beautiful and wonderful Avi Lauren Fox. Hello, Avi. Thank you for doing this today. I'm so excited to chat with you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And we're going to start again, as always, by having you tell me a little bit about your relationship with feminism. I think my relationship with feminism is one where I'm still very much learning, right? You know, I've had experiences in the world where... Uh, I've been at an, a disadvantage or an advantage because of being a woman. And it's just kind of like looking at all of those situations and understanding what equality would look like in those and then trying to work towards building that world and doing my part towards that. So I'm still a student. I can't say that I have a, a fixed definition. And I appreciate your leadership in, you know, being a thought leader in that space and, and sharing where you're at, because that's also educational too a lot of people. I will always be on this journey. And believe me, my own imposter syndrome comes up around who am I to host a podcast called Feminist Founders when I'm still figuring out all of this. So totally okay. And I appreciate your honesty. And I appreciate you joining me to talk about your business evolution, because it's been an evolution for you over the years. But the place I think I want to start is with what you called your quarter life crisis. And I want to start there because I think so many people can relate to that moment for a lot of people in their mid, late 20s, where they're kind of post-college into their career a bit and have that awakening of like, what the fuck do I actually want to do with my life? And is this, is this it? I think often that's the sort of place is like, is this, is this it? Is this really what I want? And you did a TED, X talk in 2015. And you said that you had followed the rules and you went to a good college. And yet there you were in your mid twenties, finding yourself crying your eyes out at your parents' house because you didn't really like know what you wanted to do with your life and feeling a little maybe directionless or that you had so many things you were interested in. How do you find your way through that? And even since that time, things have changed radically for you uh, because at that time, you were going down the avenue we're going to talk about a lot today around your clothing company, but you had already been, if I'm not mistaken, a photographer. 
uh, the leader of an or- environmental organization, a home organizer, a personal chef, a dance and Pilates instructor, a green building project manager, and you were just launching a clothing line at that time. That's a lot of stuff by mid twenties. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if you can just share, because I think there are so many people who are multi-passionate and we live in a world that tells us we're supposed to pick one thing and people start asking you what that one thing is by the time you're in high school, if not before, and you're supposed to pick that thing and then do that thing for the rest of your life and like be happy about it. So walk us through a little bit of your quarter life crisis and what that felt like and, you know, how you began to navigate it. And then we'll pick up with the, um, with wild mantle, your clothing line in, in a minute. I mean, that was almost a decade ago at this point. Um, like you said, I was in my mid my mid twenties. Uh, now I just actually turned thirty seven a few days ago, and uh, I really did have this idea that you go to college, you pick a career. If you pick right, it clicks in, and then you're just set. You know, I had grandparents who had very set paths in life, um, and I think that's really changing. I think I've now looking back that like my exploration and being multi passionate and having different interests and kind of getting to try them all out and not limit myself to one thing is becoming more common. Um, And I think that, uh, you know, my experience was that things didn't really click in after trying a bunch of different things. And I sort of took some time, um, you know, I was part of the boomerang generation where I went back to my parents' house and was like, what do I want to do with my life? And out of that came a desire to, do something that um, was connected to sustainability. I was interested in business, but I wanted to do it in a way where it kind of moved the dial and did business in a different way. I also wanted to, um, I was learning about women's empowerment at the time and what that was and this idea of having agency over your life um, and learning more about like the landscape of how uh, disadvantaged women were, um, not only in other cultures, but even here in America, like just the inequality that still existed. And I I felt very strongly about being self-employed and doing my own thing, particularly so that I could kind of have the reins of my life um, and my career. Uh, Now that is a double-edged sword too, because then you have to create income for for yourself and figure out how to make all of that work. Um, But yeah, so I had a, uh, you know, a moment where I moved home to my parents' house and out of, I took some time off and was fortunate to be able to do that. Um, I still kept the photography going in the background and out of that came a little fashion business that I started called Wild Mantle and we made these cozy hooded scarves out of sweaters. Um, I did a Kickstarter for it. I think raised like $40,000 and then started to get like some small retail accounts. And I really built the brand around sustainability, empowerment and adventure, which was sort of like the type of life I wanted to lead at that time. Um, And was really fortunate to have it kick in with some traction of people responding to it online and becoming customers and stuff. And that was really cool. Before we go into that, though, what was that time at your parents' house Like, and I asked this as somebody who's done the same thing, although I was a little older at the time when I did it. I did it in my 30s after my brother died and I had done the same thing. Your story resonated because I lived the good girl life. I went to the good school and I got the good grades and I got the good job and I married a good guy and built a good house and like filled it with good stuff. And I was doing everything quote unquote, right? And I was not happy. I felt rudderless and uninspired and like, that same thing of like, is, is this it? Is this, is this what I'm supposed, like, is this all there is then? (laughs) And I moved back home and I know for me, that was almost a year of self-exploration that was really transformative. What did you, how did you spend that time? And again, I love that you acknowledge, and we both need to acknowledge there's a lot of privilege in being able to take that kind of time to do that. Not everyone has that, but what a gift. And how did you spend that gift of time and how to, to help you get to a place of saying, Here's what's next. That's a great question. Um, I think I was like internally freaking out the whole time, but really tried to create some like quiet space. My my um my mom has this quote that she says, I think it might be hers, but I don't I'm not sure exactly. And it's only in the silence of myself can I know what is right for me. And so I really focused on just kind of um creating open space. And now, you know, now later 
you know, 10 years later, I, I kind of know that my creativity only comes out when there's empty space. Like I need to go on vacation or travel or like go on a trip where I'm not working, but it's secretly work time, but it's creative work time where I have no agenda. And it's really hard to call that work, but it is. And I think that was sort of my first exploration with that, where like when you create an empty room, when you create empty space, like, you know, so I think I, I sort of sunk into the uncertainty of it and the discomfort of it. Um, and I tried to engage with my life as much as I could and feel the way I want it to feel. And then kind of like felt my way towards that. Um, you know, just kind of psych myself out of my head. Well, if everything was working out, like, what would that look like? What would that be? And how would that feel? I love the idea of the silence and the creativity and that you said it's not work, but it is. We live in a world that does not value those things, right? Capitalism doesn't value quiet and space and creativity because it's not quote unquote productivity. It's not getting stuff done. It's not making widgets, right? It it doesn't, there's no value placed behind it. But anyone who's a creative knows <laughs> that you, you can't just do creativity on demand and say, I have creativity. I will turn on the creativity from nine to five and then turn it off, right? You have to, it has to come to you. It finds you. The muse is there when it's ready and you're open to receive it. And I want to talk a lot more about that because I know part of your, where you're at now is has a lot to do with that need for creativity and how you hadn't always been able to find it. And your next step after that journey of like giving yourself that space was happenstance really, because like you said, you started making these things, these mantles, these scarves or hoodies, hooded scarves, I guess they are. And you just made one for yourself from thrift store stuff and people started asking about them as often happens with a lot of great ideas where it's not even something you were by design trying to make a lot of money off of or something and found your way into that. I'm not sure I wonder because you've since left that and we're going to talk about that too. But when you were doing that time alone and having that quiet was part of the vision that you had running a company like that? Or was it sort of, it just happened and it was feeling good because of your concern around sustainability? How, like what took you to say, I'm going to do this thing. This, this is the right next step. I was like actively looking for clues and feedback in my life. Um, I had just done uh, something called the empowerment workshop with an entrepreneur um, called Josie Marin. She has like a cosmetics line and that was something that she was sort of like, I noticed that, you know, like kind of like paying attention to the feedback in life in addition to like, not be like, I want it to be this way, but like, what kind of kicks in? Like, what is their energy for? What do people want? What do people love? What do I love? Um, and so, you know, I actually, the timing of it was that I'd, I'd seen these hooded scarves in the world like three times, you know, once was in college, someone had one and I was like, can I buy one? Where'd you get that? And they're like, oh, my aunt made it. Like, I don't know. You know, and then I saw another one, a musician at a concert I was at was wearing one. And again, it was like handmade from someone that wasn't traceable. And um, so I made one for myself and it was through like wearing it out. It was like my magical hood where I was like, this is so cozy. Like it just felt good to wear. It felt like very cozy and safe, but it also was like this sort of dramatic garment that made me feel very like, like sort of like powerful and like excited to like go out on adventure. So it was sort of this, like this symbolic magical hood that um, I had and I almost thrift re thrifted it. Like I wore it a ton and then I was like, well, I'm gonna wear it one more time, right? And then that was like the night that I ended up wearing it out where like I walked into a, a, the local pub and everyone was like, what's that? Where'd you get it? And that's when I started paying attention because I walked out of there with like, you know, a few emails from people who wanted to buy one. I was like, huh, I wonder what this is. And um, then I just started wearing it more and paying attention. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how that's how that started. So it was feedback as much as like, intentionality. And then I, I wasn't like, oh, I want to have a fashion brand. I knew that I wanted to work for myself. I knew I wanted to have like do something values driven. Um, and so I kind of put those two together. I think I thought a lot more about 
and I, I actually would do this more when I would close the business, but about like what I wanted my work life to look like in addition to what I wanted to do in the world. Like, I think that's as equally important a question. The values piece was important because you really cared about sustainability and you were building that as like a socially responsible fashion label. Before we get into the end of it, though, I want to hear about the rise of it and the excitement of that, because like you said, you raised almost $40,000 on Kickstarter to get it going. And then at its peak, like you were, you got to this place of getting global media attention and you had customers all over the world. What was that part? Before it started, before the decline started to happen, what was that part like? Did you enjoy it or were you sort of going through the motions? Did you get caught up in it and the excitement of it? Was it fun then or was it always sort of, was there something that kind of told you all along this isn't quite right? No, I mean, I, I was getting a huge education, right? It was like entrepreneurship 101. Um and in a different way than I did having a photography business, which is like a very specific local, like niche, niche thing. Um, so I think the, the rise of it was very exciting. And it was also very much tied up in the rise of social media, right? And this journey with Wild Mantle and leveraging um, social media and the internet to share it with people was a huge education. And the timing of it was very interesting because, you know, the algorithms came out in, I think, 2016. And that was when I was doing my second Kickstarter. And I had a different experience in that one than the first one. And I was able to kind of understand, like, you know, when social media launched, um, it was basically like a, you know, like a community board where you posted something like here, and then someone else posted something, it replaced it on the top, and it pushed it down like this, right? And that was kind of like, what we were sold with social media was that it's this place of equality where everyone can post and share and you're connected with everyone equally and it's free and there were no ads. And then, you know, like they're companies, they need to make money. Like I totally get it. But for me, what I saw over time was a bait and switch where then there were advertisements released. And then based on whether you paid or how popular things were, um, it changed the whole way that operated. So my second Kickstarter um, well, to back up a little bit. So the first Kickstarter was really exciting because I, I experienced this like traction of people just sharing it. And suddenly like someone was backing the Kickstarter who was a friend of a friend or saw it online. And it, it kind of spread like that a little bit. Um, and I also was really fortunate to have like a celebrity or two wear it and kind of saw how that was, you know, spread. And um, I like tweeted at a reporter in Philadelphia and ended up on the cover of Philly Weekly, which was like on like, you know, the little newspaper stands all over the city. So there were a few things that were very fortuitous that that kind of happened that helped it to be known. And that was through like really like being out there and putting myself out there and actively engaging like that. Um, and so that was like really fun. And then in 2016, I did another Kickstarter. And when I launched that one, I sort of employed all of the same tactics. Um, and I had people texting me, you know, a weekend being like, hey, have you launched it yet? Like, I want to back the campaign, but I haven't seen it. And I was like, what do you mean I, you haven't seen it? I've been posting a lot, you know, and I quickly checked in with like a few fellow entrepreneurs and they're like, oh my gosh, the algorithms, like, it's this new thing. And I had to completely switch tactics in the middle and pivot. And um, you know, do a lot more like manual networking offline to help, like help make the campaign successful, which it was in the end, but it was a really big, that was sort of like a peak where then I was like, oh, this is a different landscape. And what happened is everyone started having to like, it wasn't about doing something cool and sharing it and letting the traction kick in. It was like about beating the algorithm and the job became to be known not to have that be an, the inevitable outcome of like staying in alignment with like the creative task, if that makes sense. Does it ever and does it ever resonate probably with so many people who are going to listen to this to say, oh, like, I feel that I feel that thing of putting something out and feeling like you're talking about ad nauseum, and then people still not hearing about it. And all of the noise that's out there that you're competing with, and then doing all the things that you're told you're supposed to do, and it doesn't work. And there's just no way to understand why other than exactly what you're saying. It's like, how often do we have to hear talk about the algorithm, the algorithm, and 
trying to figure out how to, you know, game the system so that you can get found. And then it feeling like the only people who get found are the people who are, who were already found before the algorithm stuff kicked in or who happen to have, you know, they're famous in some other way and are bringing all of that to those platforms. And it's really frustrating for a lot of people. And I know for you, that really changed your relationship with your company and how you were feeling about it. You said that, um, you know, you felt like, again, that you learned that success was directly correlated with being known and that it started to disconnect you from, you, these are your words, it disconnected me from the intrinsic value of my self-worth. And boy, who can feel that? Like it, everything gets so tied to the external, right? You start to lose sight of like the fact that you are just a worthy human, regardless of how many likes or shares or Kickstarter donations or whatever it is that you get, right? Or Kickstarter promises that you get. What did, and there's a couple other things you mentioned, but I really want to focus on that one first, that disconnection from your worth. What was that experience like for you? What did you notice? It just all started to feel bad. I'm a very feelings oriented person. And it just like, like, I think it transformed it from feeling like this community shared kind of like organic thing to more like almost like a multi-level marketing company or like you had to win the lottery. Like I was trying to win the lottery, but that was somehow associated by like, well, you know, uh, like, could I pull a stunt that was enough to beat the algorithm rather than just like staying and, and like, you know, I think the pressure of it is really high. Right. Because again, to me, like the kind of the bait and switch of it all, where it like worked a certain way and then the game kind of changed. And there are a lot of people who pivoted to like paid ads and had that work. Right. It's like it's pay to play or it was like win the lottery. Those were kind of the two things that I saw happening. Um, I did explore with like paid ads and that wasn't something I found success in, uh, I think, because of the nature of like what I was doing. Um and also, like, in terms of winning the lottery, it just it felt like this kind of like you were trying to be the lucky one. Um, and it just it felt really bad. So I did I did give that at like I was very determined and I was like, you know, I, I tried all these things and eventually it kind of I, I think I learned a lot about myself, too, in that process that, um, you know, I had a few thoughts like like. You know, and it, it was in fashion. So there was sort of this other perfect storm where people would be like, go sell at Barney's and then Barney's would be closing. I forget if it was Barney's that closed, but that kind of like weird contrast of like the whole industry was shifting and a lot of fashion companies were closing and things were moving online and at a different, you know, at first I would get purchase orders, which is they give you a purchase order, you get money to produce it because the bank says, oh, you have a purchase order. So we'll give you the money and then you produce it, but you have to produce like, you know, of $30,000 $30, of merchandise, and then they buy it from you after. Um, and it was switching to like a drop ship model where you had to, you had to finance it and produce it, and then things would sell one at a time. Um, so there were, there were a lot of other things that I was like, kind of just looking at the fashion industry and being like, I don't, this isn't actually, if, if I actually considered what I thought was a smart industry to be in as a business person, like it wasn't fashion. Um, and I was working with some, um, you know, I was considering, uh, like taking on investors. I spent a few years with a dedicated, you know, a dedicated, uh, on a dedicated path towards that working with different individuals. Um, I did have some offers, some weren't right. Like, you know, so that was a whole other story and trajectory. Um, and I found that really challenging to navigate to as a, as a woman having a lot of like almost me too moments, <laughs> you know, like someone being like, you got to meet this guy, you know, like he, he backs like uh, fashion designers. He's got like a, you know, a place in Italy where he has fashion shows. And then I go and I have dinner with him and he's like, I would love to, you know, um, back your line. I know this big celebrity there on my phone. Look right here. We'll do all this. And all you have to do is sleep with me. So there was kind of like a lot of, of things like that where it became very confusing to me, not knowing like what was sort of a real opportunity and what was going to lead in that direction. Those aren't almost me too move moments. Those are me too moments. <laughs> yeah, that's awful. And I don't mean to laugh and make light of them just to say that that is so horrible that that happened to you and that 
you're not an exception, I am sure, right? That that is happening and probably still happening. And of course, that would begin to affect how you feel about your worth in all of it, right? Especially when on top of, you've got the social media stuff happening where you start to feel like, I have to be this thing that is desirable enough for people to want to like click and follow and, you know, all of that in order to buy. And then when you have the business folks inside of the industry making you feel like your worth is also somehow related to your body, that is going to be really challenging. And I also, the other piece you said, the second thing that that whole experience did for you was disconnect you from your um, desire to be creative just for the sake of being creative. I would guess you entered this you know, making something. It's a handcraft. You made the thing. It felt deeply personal to you and special to you. And, and people responded to it and loved your work. That is a creative adventure. It's probably one of the big things that drew you into this industry, not so much a love of fashion, but like a love of the creative aspect. So how did your creativity get affected during that time? Yes. When I first did it, it was very much this sort of like creative outburst, you know, and that felt really good. And then over time, the focus shifted to, you know, I was also needed a job and to make money. And so it became more about the business of it. And I think that that inherently can disconnect you from your creativity because you're not making choices from like, here's this free open space where I'm going to show up and I'm just going to like do what feels good and follow that and see what comes up. It's like, well, you know, how would this fit? Like, how would this be merchandised on a shelf? And like, um, I think a lot of the feedback which that I got or advice that I got, which wasn't wrong, right? This is really good advice, like to to expand your line items. So like, you, you don't just have this one product, but like, let's sell scarves and let's sell hats and let's sell ear warmers. Like, if we're going to be a winter accessory line, let's do that. Or let's have a summer one. And I think the problem with that was that like, my heart was not in that. Like I had this thing that I was obsessed with that I loved and I wanted it. But once people had one, I was like, that's great. You have it. It's in your closet. Like, <laughs> and hopefully it'll last a while because we tried to make it really well for you. So I think that I wasn't um, very much into the iteration of fashion. I had a fashion thing that I liked. I loved the brand. Right. And I think like when I think about the Wild Mantle brand, even though I closed the business, that's still something that's like an open open like file in my mind of like, well, what would this look like in a different industry, like as a brand, you know? Um, but what I learned from that about creativity is uh, I think the greatest gift that our creative idols give us is not the example of their work, but the example of um, their relationship with their creativity, right? Because, so I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan and um Everyone's like, do you want to meet her? Do you want to meet her? I'm like, well, like, like, I just, I just like, like, I, what I appreciate her, about her so much is that she has maintained a relationship with her creativity that has withstood all of the noise around her. And she like found a craft that she likes enough to iterate on it over and over again in a way that works for her and kind of like hold the line. Right. And so I think like that's more what I aspire to. Um, and, that like, you know, fashion was not an area that I like had iterations in. That was not like, it wasn't like I was a creative person in fashion, right? Like, so I think that that, that was like a big lesson that I learned about creativity through that experience. I, I just want to hit on the third thing that you said that time of your life, that experience with Wild Mantle did, which was encouraging you to do things that you thought would please other people. And I think people are definitely going to be able to relate to that when we think about social media and you know just all the ways that we're encouraged to market and how much of that can feel like you can hear in your head going like, is this going to be the thing that people will like? And when we're at, like literally asking people to like something, right, it makes sense that we're thinking, what are they going to like? What will they want? And you can, it's easy to inside of that begin to lose sight of what you want, right? What do I want it to look like? And it sounds like that happened a bit for you that it somewhere in that process of getting kind of on this wild ride that you were on, that you kind of started to lose a little bit of what do I want here? And it got very much about that external. What do they want? I think that social media is intrinsically, like you're saying, a place that is built to bring out people's people pleasing tendencies, 
right? It's a dopamine fix if you get a like. And when you connect that with business too, it, it creates like this game essentially. Um, and so I sort of saw myself playing that. And at first I was very like, okay, I can play this game. Let's go, let's do this, you know? Um, and over time, I just learned that I didn't like how it felt. And I also like, you know, there were other things happening in my life too, where like, I just started to have these observations. Like I have a very private family, you know, and like, they're not on social media. Like my parents aren't on social media. Like I had a, um, you know, like, like some young ones being born in the family, not my own children, but like they weren't allowed on social media. And the things that I cared about the most are like the, the most special moments were not recorded. And I sort of developed this, started to realize that things that were not known were actually more satisfying and things that were known became lo like loaded, like being out there. Um, and I just want to say for a second, though, I think there's nothing wrong with being known. Like if you're an influencer and you love that, that's great. Like I have things that I want to do in my life still that would require me to pursue a path like that again, that I might do or I might not. But I think the problem is that it's become so like being successful and being known have become so intertwined first through like Hollywood culture and then through social media. And that's kind of what I've been trying to separate the last five years um, and what I sort of intentionally set out to do when I ended up closing the business. And let's talk about that piece. That's perfect. What a wonderful segue into closing the business because you walked away ultimately from something that a lot of people would say, that's the thing I'm trying to create, right? I want to get to that place where I'm getting the media attention and I'm starting to get these sales or getting into retailers or whatever it looks like. That's not an easy decision to make, to walk away from that. And I can't imagine, especially at a younger age, because were you? I don't even know if you were 30 yet, or maybe you were just into your early 30s, it sounds like. That's a hard thing to do. What gave you the audacity, and that's my one of my favorite words on this podcast, is I love talking to aud audacious people willing to do audacious things. And I think for a lot of people, that would sound audacious. Like, who are you to walk away from something that other people might say is, you know, feeling successful? What gave you the wherewithal to do that? I think I hit kind of a wall where it felt like, I think there's, I, I was really into being persistent. I thought that like determination won the day and you just had to keep going. And I think that that's really true. There are a lot of things that I've been determined about past a point that was comfortable that like have paid off. And then there are also lessons that I've had where it's like, you know, actually the, the, the lesson of growth is to know when to walk away. And to know that like something doesn't feel right and that's okay. Um, and I think that it got to a point where the brand was like, I had established this little brand, like we'd gotten a lot of um, social media attention, also like media attention. I was like going to New York for interviews and things like that. Um, but I started to feel creatively not, like I started to feel creatively boxed in. And I also started to, um, learn like I I had had a huge education by that point in terms of like how the fashion business worked and there were a lot of things that I just didn't like about it um and I didn't I sort of realized that I didn't want to tie my livelihood like my ability to pay myself and feed myself and like you know have a roof over my head and like with this game of like being something that people desired to be like so that like buy this thing, because the fashion industry is like, you want to look like this, like buy this thing, like look like, look like this and you'll feel this way. Right. I just wanted to feel that way. Um, and so that sort of in, in conjunction with, um, in conjunction with a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes, uh, either working out or not working out, um, made me decide that it was kind of like, it felt like the lesson was to walk away and to close it, um, which I, which I did. <sighs> it took me a few years. I decided, I actually decided to close it in 2018. And this was actually a really smart choice in hindsight. Um, I didn't announce that. What I did is I started to shift my focus and that's where I sort of discovered the concept of successful and unknown because 
there was, you know, by then I had developed like a community in Philly of other entrepreneurs that I was friends with. And I was talking to one of them and they were like, wait, you're thinking of not doing this. Would you come consult on my team for my company? That's like growing. And I need someone who's like a fractional, like COO with me or whatever, like just to come in and problem solve. Right. Cause when you're an entrepreneur, you learn, like, you just learn so much. You have to be the person that has an answer to everything. Um, and so I started to do that. And then, you know, one client turned into two, which turned into three. And then I had this like, like the foundation of like a thriving business consulting, like gig thing happening that nobody knew I did. I did not have a website. It was like therapy. I was not saying I was doing it on the internet. And then, you know, and in conjunction with the photography that I kind of been doing all along, I directed that more towards commercial. And so between like 2018 and, and last year, I really grew this like quiet consulting, uh, little team. I have a project manager I work with now and, um, and actually I'm about to bring on another one. And like, I launched a website a year ago, but before that, like no one knew about it. People, I still run into people. They're like, how's your clothing business? <laughs> and so I, I got to experience a type of work, like a type of work that felt way better than when I was doing something that like looked successful to the world, but like it wasn't resonating with me in terms of the experience of being in it. And that was like a really big lesson. And that's when I started to like, you know, in the middle of conversations with friends talking about things and they're like, like, you know, we're talking about social media and everything. And I'm like, man, I really just want to be successful and unknown. They're like, yes, what's that? <laughs> and I want to talk a whole lot more about that in a second. What you just said made me think of my own first marriage, where it's like something that looks great to the world, but doesn't feel good for you inside of it. And I fully relate to it there. And also I have relate to it in various parts of my career where it's like, you know, when I was doing the thing I was said I was going to do and should do when I was in journalism and working my way up certainly it looked really great to everyone else. And people would be like, wow, that's what you do. And all I could think is like, yeah, and I don't really love it. But you, there's a part of you that feels like you can't even say that because everyone else thinks it's so great. And then you start thinking it creates this like, what's wrong with me that I can't be as impressed and satisfied by my career as other people seem to be. That's a really hard place to be. And you found your way into this consulting accidentally again, which sounds like a lot of like the moves you make, right? It's kind of like, well, this, it, like things just kind yeah. of fall into place and there's nothing wrong with that. And we can talk more about that too. But one thing I saw that you said that I thought was really interesting was that you thought you had to have a business that did millions of dollars in sales to be a good business person and to be of value to anyone. And that can go back to some of that self-worth stuff we talked about, but also just as, you know, when people were asking you to consult, you had this feeling of like, who am I to do that? If I don't have this million dollar business in front of me or that I'm working on, who am I to help other people? And I think so many people can relate to that fraud feeling, that quote unquote imposter syndrome sort of feeling. How did you navigate that in the beginning? Yeah, well, it took it took working with someone who did have like a business that was doing sales in the millions and like, like having me come in and make observations and make recommendations and then implement those and see that bring sales up and like help with that for me to be like, oh, wait a minute, right? Because I had like one data point, right, of the fashion industry. And so I started to realize that my skill set really translated and that situations were so much more complex. Um, and also it took working with a few clients where I was very transparent up front and being like, why do you want me to do this? Like my thing, like I, I didn't sell it for like a hundred million dollars. I didn't even sell it. I'm just closing it. Like, why are you... Why would you want me to help? Um, and the answer was like, because of the obstacles, you know, someone said to me, um, if I'm going to, you know, hire someone to fight in a battle, I don't want someone with no scars. I want to see that they've like made it through and survived. And so I found that people were more interested in the challenges that I had experienced and my perspective on them than like, just having kind of like a smooth ride and like everything working out. So, and, and also, you know, I sort of have found this niche in working with solo entrepreneurs who aren't trying to build hundred million dollar companies. Um, I had a conversation with actually someone who was an intern for me with wild mantle uh, about, I think we spoke in 2020 and maybe she was working with me five years before that. 
And, um, you know, I was just starting to ponder all this successful and unknown stuff. And I think she was working at Google or something. And she said, you know, like I want to start a business or I like might want to do something on my own, but all of the books out there are on how to like girl boss your way to the top. And she was like, what if I just want to make like a hundred grand a year and that's success to me and I can do things on my own time and have my own life. And I was kind of like, oh yeah, like why don't we champion that more? (laughs) Like in our society, like why is it, why are we celebrating only people who um, make it to the top, so to speak, when if you look at the numbers, like that's the edge of the bell curve. Like why don't we value the middle more? Um, And so that's kind of been, been my perspective of trying to have like a normal state, like stability, right? Fashion is very not stable, especially with the numbers, like it's up, it's down, you know, um, and seasons. And so, uh, yeah, so that's been kind of my, my journey with that. Yeah, I hear you saying that you had to do it to sort of get over the imposter syndrome. And the thing that keeps us from taking the action is that feeling of being a fraud. And the horrible and also amazing problem with that is the only thing that often helps us get past that is to actually do the work. It's this catch 22. I can't do the work until I feel confident, but I can't get confident until I do the work. And so for people to hear that, that you had to just do it with the fear and just do it. And then that starts to reinforce for you like, oh, I can do this. And I do know what I'm talking about. People will pay me for this. The part about the enough stuff is totally my jam. But first, what were you going to (laughs) say? Well, I was just going to say also, it's funny now because I have a, like, I didn't set out to be a consultant, but now that I am one and I've like, you know, worked with like a few hundred businesses, right? I've seen the insides of them and some nonprofits. And so I have this like data set, right? Of perspective on all these different businesses. And um, it's just interesting to see how varied things are. Um, And often like, when you do have, like, I, I now understand that when you do have success, like sometimes people build it like inch by inch by inch by inch by inch by inch, right? But the kind of success we know in society is like a hockey stick, like something happens. And usually that thing that happens is like, you know, very lucky, like largely based on luck. And I, I hear this when I talk to, um, you know, friends or, you know, people who are older about their relationships. I'm like, how did you end in a, in a, like a happy marriage? Like when you look back, like, and they're like, oh, we had no idea. Like we just got lucky that the person we married was like a good person. Like people don't talk about how, how lucky that is, <laughs> you know? And so I think there are like different ways to grow and luck is definitely one of them. And also I just became more interested in like the slower, like I wanted to know how to do it like slowly over time. And I've had that experience now from working with other businesses and also just growing my own little scrappy, you know, consulting, consulting business. Yeah. Those are not the things that make for the exciting stories and the easy sell because everyone wants to, you know, wants to get rich quick thing and those stories sell. So if you put that out there, then people say, Oh, I want that. Unfortunately, exactly what you're saying. There's not a lot of acknowledgement of, But part of this story is something that is not probably or very unlikely something that you can replicate. We don't share, they don't share that part. And that is so unfortunate. And everyone is chasing that. It used to be six figures, then seven. And now people are talking about eight figure business. Like there's never enough. And so when you mentioned about sort of the enough piece of why can't we celebrate $100,000 $100,000 and happiness. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's so important. And to me, what I heard you saying is that what you're doing now, and actually you wrote something about what you're doing is kind of boring <laughs> compared to what, you know, other things you've done, like on the, on two outsiders, it might look more boring than like running a, a fashion label or something, but you're getting now all the things you didn't get when you were doing that thing that others might have seen as more exciting. You were getting the financial stability, creative fulfillment, life and work balance, as much as any of us can get balance in those things. And that you're really feeling like this is it, but it's probably not the thing that would have been appealing to you back when you were having that quarter life crisis to say, if somebody had said, well, you could just do this and it would be really satisfying. You were still in that place of chasing. So I don't know if there's even a question inside of that, except I just want to celebrate it because we need to celebrate more that it's okay to say 
it doesn't have to be flashy and exciting and a million dollars. It can just feel really good. I agree. And I think like when I was in the process of closing Wild Mantle, I asked myself a lot of questions like, like, well, what about this doesn't work for me? What, what did I, what was I trying to grow the company to do? And it was like to gain more time freedom and flexibility and location, you know, and actually scaling that, that business like might have gotten me that someday if I sold it, right? It sort of is like the, it's like the someday and that would have been great. Like there's another path where like maybe that worked out and I grew it and then I sold it and that's like, would have been super cool. But I also was like, well, how could I have that now, right? Like how can I give myself more balance? Um, how can I get, like have a, a job that is location flexible, um, and I, like, I have, I, I really nerd out on like how I work as much as what I'm doing. And I feel like I've gotten closer and closer and I have realized that version of it. Now there, there are other things that I desire now, like new dreams I'm coming up with. I can see, you know, some new dreams like bubbling up for the next five years or 10 years, but I'm in a position now where I can like let that unfold in a long arc and have like, you know, as much stability as one can have as a solo entrepreneur, um, from this, which has been really great. That's the kind of thing I work with my clients on. And I'm sure you probably do as well, but my work is really very much around that of saying, yes, there is probably a world and a world that you are in and you can see where you can play this game because it, it feels like a game, like you said. And at the end of that, there's going to be some payoff. But what does it feel like while you're playing the game? And how long is that going to take? How long do you have to be in that place, which often feels like suffering? How long are you going to suffer before you get a payoff? And what is the, what does the story look like without the suffering to get to the payoff? Maybe the payoff isn't as great. Maybe it's not as huge. But what does it feel like as you pursue it? And is that okay? For some people, it's not. Like you said, for some people, it's not okay. They, they want to go that route that the being known, being wildly rich, all of those things are, are the only values. Like they have to do that. This is not the episode for you. But for those people who are like, that's my aim was never to be famous. Being well, wildly wealthy might be nice, but like also I want to feel good. So what does it look like to say, how much is actually enough? How does it feel good to go about getting that? It's such a radical shift. And you called it sort of, you know, countercultural to be thinking in this other way, which you have called, as you said, successful and unknown, slow marketing, thinking about how you're going about running your business, marketing your business differently in a way that actually feels really good if you are someone like Avi and like myself and like many of my clients who have gotten to a place. And I do think the part of your story of the pursuit before is important because sometimes we have to kind of go down through that sliding door to say, well, maybe that path does feel good to find out maybe it, we're not, it isn't right for us to get to the place now saying that isn't right for me. <laughs> and so you said you just had a website a year ago, like four years into your business. You're building your business largely through referrals, through networking, connection. Are those the things that are, when you talk about successful and unknown, like I think the term, I loved it when we talked the first time about it, I'm like, Oh, that's juicy and good. And it needs to be in the world because I can't tell you the number of people who that sits with them. Like, yes, I don't want to have to always be out there. I don't want to be seen, but I do want to feel successful. So when you think about successful and unknown, like what's, what are some of the big shifts for you and what it looks like? So I was supposed to give a talk at a conference on, and I was going to do it on being successful and unknown. Like it was literally like printed online that that's what the talk was. And then I decided not to because it felt ironic to talk about being successful and unknown. And I just want to recognize that irony, right? Because it's like, I think I've been, I've been rethinking um, achievement in the age of social media. And, but this is also something that resonates with other people of how do we find success Um in a quiet achievement sense and not have it be tied to this, you know, huge, huge push. Um, because being successful, like being seen as successful does not mean things look good behind the scenes as we've established, right? Like we think that looking successful means you're making money. Those are not the same things all like, right. And you can be like very successful at something and not be making money or not, you know? And so um, I think that what it's looked like for me 
has been a shift towards um, like prioritizing creative fulfillment, um, like looking at life work balance more, finding financial stability and prioritizing that in a way that feels smart rather than feels exciting. That makes sense. Um, and, you know, this idea of slow marketing and realizing that like, okay, so I know that there are people who go and play social media ads and then get business from it. And like, that has never worked for me. I just, I don't try to get business anymore because whenever I've intentionally tried to do that, it like feels bad and doesn't work. And what I've, what I've learned is that when you are the thing that people need and you show up and do a good job for them, then they're going to tell their friends. I never ask for referrals. It doesn't come out of my mouth. I just try to be the, I just try to like do right by them. And then if I'm lucky, someone calls me in six months and is like, oh, my friend hired you. They had a great experience. They tell me you're the person I need. So I think I'm, I'm also, you know, I became compelled by, I call it the like neighborhood electrician complex because I noticed that like, you know, my neighborhood electrician has a horrible website and is always busy. You don't see neighborhood electricians like with 10 million followers on Instagram or worried about it at all. They have a truck with their number on it. Maybe rarely business cards, rarely a website, rarely social media. It is about, I need an electrician. This one's good. And isn't going to like screw you over. And like slow marketing too, you know, that's really been something I'm, I think that's like an actual term, but it's something I started thinking about in my head where, um, and it came from working with like a few clients who asked me to do newsletter for them. And I think I had something on my website for a while where it was like newsletter sign up and it's like sign up for my incredibly unfrequent emails. And instead of being like, like trying to get people to sign up, it was like, I'm going to forget to email you. But if you leave your email here, like you might get something from me twice a year. <laughs> and like, that's just what's, what's worked for like the type of business that I've had. Like I found that if you're quiet most of the time, then when you say something, people have the capacity to hear. To borrow a term from engineering, I think with social media, there's so much noise that there's no signal, right? And so a lot of my approach has been, how do I like take away the noise between me and other people so that if I if and when I say something, it's heard. And I sort of reserve that. I'm not trying to send, have you ever signed up for a newsletter or like a clothing business? And by the time you get home from the store, you have like four emails. I'm like, what kind of time do you think I have? <laughs> like, I can't wait to splash that quote all over social media speaking of social media but i love that about like if you're you have to be quiet because then when you say something people listen and that is really powerful thank you for sharing i'm gonna sit with that one and think about it you're gonna for people who are subscribers to the newsletter is newsletter and if you're not go subscribe to the famous founders newsletter because we're gonna have you share three tips for like going down this path of sort of successful and unknown of slow marketing of changing the way you're thinking about your marketing your business. So if you want to get those three specific tips, subscribe, and we're gonna do that in just a minute. But before we finish up a couple, I want to kind of move towards one other thing. Your path has been all over the place. We said in the beginning, you had all these different jobs, then you went to the clothing thing. And now you're doing consulting. And it's kind of been a little of, you know, career hopping and um, interest hopping, because you are a creative person. And for creative people, this idea of picking one thing and sticking with, it, sticking with it forever can be really constricting and doesn't feel good. You you want to be able to explore different passions. And I think a lot of people can relate to that idea of mul being multi-passionate. And I saw somewhere, something you said that your um, that experience of career hopping sort of felt like a treasure hunt to you of like, each thing is leading to something else. And it's like, you're just on this like treasure hunt. And maybe it sounds like, because you're already talking about dreams for five years from now, that that treasure hunt, you don't see it as something that is going to end or needs to end. How have you gotten to a place of going from kind of in your, that quarter life crisis of crying of like, I don't know what the thing is to now being more open to being like, it's okay if I don't know what the thing is. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, I think at that, when I had that quarter life crisis, you know, I, I moved home to my parents' house. And then when I made the transition from wild mantle to, um, doing consulting, it was something that I was able to make on my own and kind of like transition as an adult. 
And I think that that made me realize that I wanted to reserve the right to do that again in the future and that that could be inevitable, right? You know, I've had this this inner dialogue of like, am I a doctor? Am I a lawyer? Which I think comes from being in school as a kid. And they're like, here are the things you can do in the book. Like that stuff resonates deep. I remember getting to college and like being like, what's HR, right? Like I think I would have been like very a very good um, HR person, um, and I just like didn't, it, it wasn't something that I really was aware of or like, there's so many little things, like the way the world works outside of that sort of like, you're a doctor or a lawyer or a firefighter or a teacher. Um, I think as an adult, I've discovered exploring different things is also okay. And you sort of become an expert in, um, in pivoting and, in having like a broader worldview than just one one specific thing. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm now. I, th- I think I've just been like working on self acceptance of and also appreciation for the beauty of being able to have multiple passions and explore them and also see how they play together. Right? Like I used my photography to start Wild Mansell. Like I I photographed them and like that was like the main. A, a really like important marketing piece. Um, and with Wild Mantle, I used the skill set I gained from like launching and growing a business to understand the mechanisms that did or didn't do that and help other clients with that. You know, and now I think I'm really understanding. Um, I just did it. I just did my Reiki certification levels one and two, and I'm about to do my third. Um, I've always like been interested in the woo-woo world, but I believe in science. Like it's kind of both to me. And I noticed that like some of the sessions that I have with clients that are the most impactful, especially I have this little niche where I work with um, women solo entrepreneurs who are, um, you know, uh, values driven and slightly spiritual. And the things that they tell me are the most helpful are when we get real with like, when I'm like, okay, what is this really about? Like, this is not about your your uh, G suite tangle, like what's going on here energetically? Like, why is this here? What is the lesson in it? Like, how is this a repeated pattern? And so um, I'm excited to increase my skill set in that area and see where that takes me um, in the future. And you also have backyard chickens, Fiona, Marigold, and Penelope. I just want to say their names because they're such cute names. And it just sounds to me like you're somebody like, it's not just in your it, you know, the Reiki certification, you're bringing it into your professional life, but also it's really just something you personally want to explore. So you're allowing for this creative freedom in all sorts of ways, which I think is amazing. And something that that 25 year old version of you was probably just, she, she didn't know how to say that's what she wanted. But I think that sounds like what she wanted was like, instead of what am I supposed to do? How can I do all the things that excite me and still feel successful, quote unquote, successful in a world that says success looks like being that lawyer or being the doctor or being the what the CEO, whatever the thing is, it's about the title. And how do you instead say success? I want to feel successful in a broader sense. I've want my whole life to feel rewarding. Yeah, no. And I mean, backyard chickens was like a dream of mine. I actually have a picture. You want to see a picture of them? Because I'm making my, I put them on my holiday card and I'm making next year's holiday card. So I have this last year's out. That's the girls. I love it. They're beautiful. But yeah, like I think in terms of dreams too, I'm learning that. um, And this is a conversation I have with my friends all the time. Like we think attaining X goal will make us feel like this, but really we just want to feel like that. Um, And sometimes having your dream come true does feel really good. Like having backyard chickens was a dream and it feels as good as I thought it was. Then there are other dreams that like don't. So I think it's constantly like checking in and being able to pivot and adapt, um, which isn't something I'm perfect at. Like I struggle with all this stuff we're talking about. Like I think the biggest secret is that like people who are on podcasts or in the news, like have it figured out. And it's like, no, they've just had to struggle enough that they've like now can articulate what they've gone through. (laughs) Thank you for sharing that. And honestly, that was one of the reasons, you know, when we met and we talked, I love this idea of successful unknown and just talking about what that looks like or what that could be. And even though I know you're still in this process of kind of exploring it, figuring it out as you go, I think just talking about it is going to make people feel seen in that notion of this is so hard. I don't want to have to be a internet 
celebrity in order to just like make a good living. That just feels exhausting. But also I really want to talk about your, you know, that trajectory with the company that you had and let go, because I do think it's important to talk about what others might see as failures. It's obviously not a failure, but talking about those experiences we have that don't work out the way we thought they would, because I think it's so important for people to hear, because I know people are going to hear some of this experience you had on that arc with that company and kind of the high and then the low of it. And they're going to hear themselves in that too. And to know that they're not, there's not something wrong with them because they haven't won the lottery yet. You know, that that is what, that's how most of these stories go. We just don't hear those stories. And I think it's important to share them. So thank you. And before we go, then the last two things, I want to see if you could share a resource that people might find helpful or interesting. It could be a book or a podcast. This is actually a very, it's a boring resource, but it's helpful. Um, it's one I recommend a lot. And are you able to share a link? I can share a link in the show notes. So yeah, you can look for the notes and you will be able to find the link that you're going to share. Yeah. So this is actually, it's another consulting firm that I'm not at all attached to. But when I first became self-employed, I, well, not when I first became self-employed, when I first started consulting, um, like what to charge is such a big question, right? And we think about things in terms of, well, what would my salary be if I worked for a company? But that includes, you know, benefits and this and that. Um, and so it's a rate calculator that allows you to put in like what you would want your salary to be. And then it backtracks that into what your hourly rate would be. And I found that to be so helpful. And I've like given it to a lot of people. Um, and they've told me it's been instrumental. So if you're trying to work for yourself and you're doing something where you need to have an hourly rate, like understanding that, cause you know, it's not based on a 40 hour work week when you're a consultant, like 20 billable hours a week is like full time, full time, because there's all this other stuff that you have to do to make your business run. And like, so that's been a really helpful resource. It's a boring one, but it'll help you be successful and unknown. <laughs> I don't think it's boring at all. I think it's something that most people when they go freelance and or self employed, you know, however you're viewing your work, anyone who's trying to do an hourly rate, it is, it is always a challenge for people to figure out. So I'm excited to share that resource. And I think a lot of people will find it very interesting, not boring. So thank you. And then last, a nonprofit or an organization that's doing great work in the world that we can highlight. I'm going to highlight Get Included. And it's actually a, a nonprofit in my hometown. That's a client of mine that I love. I go to their coffee shop all the time. And they provide employment for individuals of all abilities. And they do a lot of great work in, you know, uh, the neurodiversity world and kind of like really looking at inclusion. Um, and if you're near Narberth, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia, you can go to Get Cafe. It's like a very wonderful experience. Um, or you can check out their website online, which is getincluded.org. I will make a donation to say thank you for your time here today. And I hope people listening will do the same. This has been a really great conversation that I think people are definitely going to see themselves in and feel really validated in. Um, and also, I think it's some really great ideas for changes they can make. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I love this podcast and how you're holding space for these types of conversations. I think it's really important work. So thank you for your time. This is a lot to organize. So I, I appreciate that. Well, thank you. That was so nice. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Feminist Founders Podcast. If you like what you heard and want to learn more, or if you'd like to support the work that I'm doing with the show, please visit feministfounderspodcast.com. There you can find out about becoming a paid subscriber for as little as the price of one cup of coffee a month, which will directly support my work. You can also find the show notes and find the bookshop.org website where you can order any of the books mentioned in this or any episode, which will also support the work I'm doing. The link to all of that is in the show notes. Thanks again, and I can't wait for our next episode.